President Vladimir Putin has ordered Russian nuclear forces on high alert amid tensions with the West over his invasion of Ukraine. The order places Russia's nuclear weapons on an increased readiness to launch, raising the threat that Moscow's invasion and the West's response to it could boil over into nuclear warfare. Vladimir Putin said that the incursion in Ukraine would be quick and it would be swift. But his troops are being met with resistance and resilience from the people of Ukraine and the soldiers that are fighting, including the president. I'm Adrian Batra, and with me is Peter McKay, Canada's former national defense minister. Peter, there are ongoing discussions around uh, from world leaders about what to do. We now know, however, that Vladimir Putin is quite intent on potentially using his nuclear arsenal. So where does that put the rest of the world? What should we be doing? Well, it certainly puts people on notice and makes them very nervous. I, for one, don't think that this will happen. At least that's certainly our, our, our hope. And I believe that it is, as you indicated, uh, a sign that things are not going as well in Ukraine as Vladimir Putin might have thought they would. And that the Ukrainian people who are tough, who are uh, persistent, they're going to defend their homeland with everything they have their military, their reserves, uh, their citizens, street by street, town by town, the president himself, the former president, the mayors, uh, people who are uh, fighting for their very lives and existence and sovereignty. And so it could very well turn into a very protracted and difficult uh, ground offensive for the Russians. But let's not make any mistakes about this. The, the Russians have much superior firepower, numbers, equipment. And so that comes back to the question of what can the West do? What can Canada do? And the short answer is much more. Uh, we're starting to see it. And we are seeing the delivery of their requested military assistance along with the sanctions. And the sanctions will bite and it will take some time. But all of this is going to have a very detrimental impact on Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin, his inner circle, the oligarchs, the, the kleptocrats he surrounds himself with, it will have a, a very drastic and negative impact on them. But for the people of Ukraine, what they need right now is armor. They need artillery. Ex yeah. They need. It's exactly they, what the, they need the, the type of military. Said. Yeah, that's he exactly said, I don't what need they a need. Ride. Yeah, the infamous were, uh, saying around the world now, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. And so with uh, Russia's ability for that far superior military uh, weaponry, they, the Ukraine doesn't have the air support, they barely have the ground support. And frankly, whatever ammunition they have left, it's in spare, it's, 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 you know, they're using it sparingly, but it seems to be effective. This is not the same Ukrainian military from 2014, for example, when Putin came in and, uh, you know, just stomped into Crimea and took it over. But this is a very well-trained, in part, thanks to militaries such as Canada going in and helping train our troops and, and other troops from around the world, going and giving them all types of uh, assistance. But... Is this now where we see just the most obvious of aggressing, uh, aggression from Vladimir Putin? Things that you, you wrote about in the, in the Toronto Sun recently, we haven't seen this type of incursion since the, the, the 30s. What is it that is going to take for countries around the world to say, okay, well, we're going to put boots on the ground and we are going to send in all that heavy artillery and equipment in order to keep Russia, uh, the Russia's military out? What will it take? Well, as I said in that article, my fear is that uh, this could take a turn for the worst. Uh, the Russians clearly have that superior advantage when it comes to their armament, their, their military equipment, and the sheer size of their army. The air cover, um, the gunships, the helicopters, the fighter aircraft, if that turns, then the question for NATO and Western countries, including our own, becomes, do we want to fight them in Ukraine or do we want to fight them on mainland Europe? What's next? Is it Poland? Will it be Hungary? Where will Vladimir Putin and the Russian army decide to go next? And his ambition, let's make no mistake about it, 
is to recreate, recreate the Soviet Union. He, he wants to pull those satellite countries back in. He already de facto controls Belarus, but he looks at the, uh, the Balkans, uh, the Baltic countries. He looks at uh, former uh, Soviet countries as really his own. He, he said of Ukraine, we're like brothers, to which President Zelensky said, yes, Cain and Abel. And so the West has a decision to make. They can continue to send uh, as much military equipment as possible. And getting it into the country is going to become increasingly difficult, as, as you know. Uh, the airports have been blown up, destroyed, or occupied. So bringing material in is a, is a challenge, to be sure. But the question is, do we wait for them to roll into a NATO member country, which triggers, triggers Article 5, and then, uh, then we're really into it? Or do we take a more pro proactive approach? And in addition to uh, sending in the, the type of military equipment that they need, which is a, a much heavier armament. I mean, goodness, uh, Adrian, they're, they're fighting street to street with small arms mm -hmm. and Molotov cocktails. They, they are hit out in, hiding out in underground um, tunnels and, and uh, subway systems. And it's, uh, you know, they're, they're on their back heels, but they're certainly going to fight and they're highly motivated. And if we give them more equipment, they can hold the line. But eventually, boots on the ground will enter the discussion, in my opinion, or we're prepared to let Ukraine fall and wait for the next Maginot line to be crossed. And I think that's part of the, the big calculus. Putin knows the appetite by Western countries, particularly the citizenry, to enter some sort of protracted war to put boots on the ground. Most populations are loath to do so in part because of the history, in part because the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, all of these things uh, loom large in, in the memories of the citizenry for, for Western democracies. But this is happening now. This is clear and present in in. And the reality of someone who is clearly unstable, unhinged, and unable to uh, act reasonably and act as a good world character has his finger on the proverbial button. And, and if anything is going to give world lead, the rest of the world leaders, the NATO leaders, cause to pause, is that very threat. Where we now, of course, Peter, have Belarus saying they will host Moscow's nuclear uh, arsenal if, if necessary. And, and sanctions are what they are. It does take time. I think some of them are starting to, to bite. The oligarchs will feel some, some, some pain, but it hasn't all come into effect yet. But there are tangible things that, say, Canada can do right now in order to um, help the people of Ukraine and, of course, cause that discomfort for Russians. What are those things? That's all true, what you've said. And uh, certainly the history is, is raw and is real and, uh, and is you know, relatively recent. It's within the lifetime of our parents when we saw conflict on mainland Europe. The things that Canada could continue to do is, you know, chip away at the propaganda that is being perpetrated. And that means shutting down some of the channels that uh, that Russia has used. It means, obviously, uh, further financial sanctions that will stem the flow of income into Russia because they have to fund this. And, um, you know, their businesses are going to feel this and and in turn put pressure on Vladimir Putin. The people of Russia are not entirely behind this, although they are, they are afraid and they are whipped and they have uh, suffered under this regime. Putting direct pressure on government members and uh, people that are close to Putin, I think will also have that deterrent effect. Shutting down the supply of uh, materials into Russia, uh, including technical materials, and refusing to take their products, most importantly, their energy. And Germany made a major decision last week, as you know, to shut down further construction of the Nord Stream 2. And I think what you are going to see increasingly is the world, including Canada, saying we're not taking your product. We're not taking Russian gas. I mean, here in little old Nova Scotia, they stopped uh, putting Russian vodka on the shelves. All of this, as you rightly indicated, will take time. But the big issue I come back to is getting military equipment into the hands mm -hmm. of the Russian army, the resistance, I dare say, tanks, 
javelin type missiles, stinger missiles that were used in Afghanistan, of which we, we have very few, but the reality is that type of equipment. Canada recently committed another 25 million, which included night vision goggles and sniper rifles and helmets and body armor. Again, all helpful. But if Ukraine falls, it will all be too little too late. And as much as Putin has been saber rattling and threatening nuclear options and saying those who help Ukraine, we uh, you know, are putting themselves in harm's way, the Russians are getting help as well. Let's, uh, let's be clear, they're also getting support from other countries, uh, countries that are, of course, our traditional adversaries, including Iran, mm -hmm. including, I suspect strongly, uh, although not overtly, China, as far as equipment is concerned. And so we do see the potential for further escalation. But the bottom line is this. Uh, Russia has broken every international convention and law and, and moral justification in what they have done. Crossing into sovereign Ukraine, as they did in 2014 in Crimea, this is uh, unacceptable. And the world community has to unite. We have to come together in condemning in every possible way and in every practical way, providing the Ukrainian people with the enablers to resist this horrible invasion. And we've recently learned at the Toronto Sun that both Bell and Rogers will no longer be carrying Russia today, which, of course, is basically a propaganda arm for Moscow. So that's one step in in order to ensure that, you know, there is real information, not disinformation about what is going on in, in this um, escalating war. Peter, years ago, um, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, of course, was uh, led the charge to get Russia kicked out of then the G8. Of course, now it's the G7. And we all know um, Prime Minister Harper infamously said to him, you know, get out of get out of Ukraine, get out of uh, the territory. We are facing a, a crisis of leadership in this country. Many people don't feel that Prime Minister Trudeau is either up to the job or has been doing the job, um, particularly on the heels of the Emergencies Act. Now we're in a very real uh, global situation. And there is a, uh, there's an opening in the job that is uh, your former party. Is this something that you are considering, looking at, bringing in that new leadership that Canadians are so desperately looking for? Well, there, there certainly is uh, an opening, and, and I have not said no. And as you know, Adrian, I uh, ran for the leadership of my party uh, just about two years ago. So it's, it's a major consideration, to be sure. I'm getting lots of calls, having lots of discussions. My focus uh, has been on my work, my family, and quite frankly, this issue, which has mm -hmm. uh, come upon us. Uh, I have friends in Ukraine. Uh, I visited the country many times. It's a, it's a country that is very close to Canada, over 1.3 million Canadians of Ukrainian descent. And so I think that Canada has uh, a moral obligation and the type of connective tissue to Ukraine that uh, brings this very much to the front. You, you mentioned the recent decision by Canadian telecommunications. I think our concern for their cyber attacks and the insidious impact that they have around the world with spies and individuals who are in our countries causing not only misinformation and disinformation, but harm to the fabric of our countries. We need to send those people home and send a message. And the, uh, the opportunity, in, in my opinion, to put Russia back uh, and in a bit of a box, considering what they tried to do, and this isn't, you know, and, and I reminded by my own spouse that uh, this isn't the Russian people this is the mm -hmm. regime, and this is the madness of Vladimir Putin, as we've seen in places like Iran and other countries that fall under the heel of a, of a very totalitarian regime. And so there is certainly more that Canada can and should do. Um, that doesn't appear to be the direction that's coming directly from the prime minister, but others within his government. But uh, Canadians are out in the street. Certainly Ukrainians are fighting in the street, and Russians interestingly, are also in the street, although yeah. they are quickly scooped up and, uh, and imprisoned. Uh, so it's a call to arms for everyone. And um, it's a, yeah. we, we in Canada are, can, can do much more. People are going out there to protest the Russian government, the people of Russia, at very great risk to themselves. And I, I, you know, we, we, see, we see the images, we recognize their bravery, and it takes a lot of courage 
to to do that, to stand up against your government, particularly one that is so, he just strongs arm the citizenry. And I, I want to sort of look to the, the future. Uh, we know that there has been some, you know, Putin has said, oh, we'll talk, we'll have conversations. But those are just those are just words. He, he's not quite serious about it. No, what he's not. If, yeah. What if for as we see things moving, um, you know, when first in the first I'd say 24 hours, Peter, I thought this is going to happen swiftly and quickly once the airport was taken in Kiev. But the Ukrainian people have proven their resilience yet again. Peter, if this fails for Putin, which we hope it does, what does he do next? We know that he's had his sights on the Arctic for some time, which is a direct impact for Canada. What happens to Putin? Well, there's a number of things that can happen. There can be internal revolt within Russia, which would be a or- more organic uh, end to his, uh, his reign of terror. And he could wind up at the end of a rope in Red Square or you could see him fail and continue to suffer the, uh, the effects of sanctions and the internal derision within his own country that could result in his arrest. And he winds up in a prisoner's dock at The Hague. Uh, he's a very unstable individual, yet very crafty. He uh, served in the, in the Soviet uh, KGB, now FSB. And you know he has set his sights on uh, recreating, as I said earlier, the Soviet Union. He's also set his sights, I believe, on the Canadian Arctic and knows the enormous potential of the resources there. And we sometimes forget in our country, Adrian, that the Russians are our neighbors. It doesn't show up as readily on the map as, uh, as, and, and we don't spend a lot of time thinking about that. I have, as a defense minister and foreign minister, I remember getting into disputes with Sergei Lavrov about some of their activities there. And they are active. They're reclaiming military bases. They have Tupelo bombers, aircrafts that come right into or up to our airspace, which is why we need fighter aircraft like F-35s. And I I suspect that they will continue to push every advantage that they have with the feeling that we won't respond and won't respond with strength uh, the way the Ukrainian people have, quite frankly. And so it isn't sometimes until you're in the tiger's mouth that you feel the threat. And yet certainly what we see in Ukraine is very foreboding. Uh, if this flows into other countries, including Poland, uh, we are going to see massive, massive unrest throughout Europe and a rallying cry. And let's hope it doesn't come to that. But mm-hmm. right now the Ukrainians are fighting for us all. And that's why we need to be with them in a more substantive way. Well, we all stand with Ukraine. And the only person that knows the timeline of all these events, of course, is potentially a madman. Well, let us know what you think in the comments below. What more could Canada do? What should we be doing? And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.